to you today with Cedric Sanders. Um, this is part two of him breaking the silence about the sexual assault that he encountered when he was a teenager and how it has affected him even now going into adulthood. Um, we're talking to Sam Cedric because he has decided that this year he wants to um, advocate more. He wants to speak up about the um, abuse that he dealt with um, when he was younger. And then also realizing that what happened to him is still affecting him now, even as an adult. So we are going to have Cedric with us today. And um, last time what we spoke, when we talked to Cedric, we were talking to him about the, the assault that happened to him when he was a teenager and it took place at his workplace. So not only was he assaulted, but he was assaulted at his workplace by someone that he trusted and someone that he considered or thought was a friend. Um, he shared with us how there were a couple of instances where this person attacked him or harassed him in different situations at work and how he felt betrayed and how he also felt as if there was really nothing that he felt comfortable doing because of the fact that it was his boss at his job. He felt that he um, was helpless and that if he would have done something, it not only would have affected his job, but that people might have looked at him differently. Um, he didn't report the assault to his family or to his friends. It wasn't until a couple of years later when the abuser or his attacker attacked someone else at work that it came out that this person was a predator. At that time, Cedric was given the opportunity to share his story. And that is where we left off two weeks ago when we were talking to him about his story. So tonight we're gonna to continue talking to him. We're going to catch up on what has happened since he decided to break his silence here on the Speak Up and Inspire series a couple of weeks ago, because a lot of things have happened since then. And we wanted to continue talking to him about his experience, about speaking up, and, and to also find out what the results were of the charges that took place against his um, attacker and also to find out how it has shaped him as a man now and then how it has affected or how it has given him reason to speak up and help others in his community including other boys and other men who might be silent about the sexual assault that they have endured or they have encountered so we're going to go ahead and bring Cedric on with us right now so that we can continue our interview with him. And as we stated last week in our, um, no, sorry, the week before in our podcast, that if you have any questions for any of our guests, please put them in the comments. And at the end, we will take about 10 minutes to answer your questions at the end of the interview. Before we were looking at the questions during the interview and answering them as we, as we go, but we want to dedicate the time at the end to answer all of your questions so that we can make sure that we get all of your questions and we're not interrupting the interview. This is very important, not only to us for having the opportunity for Cedric to share a story with us, but it's also important to him as well to be able to share his story. So we're gonna go ahead and bring Cedric on with us right now. And we're gonna continue our conversation or our interview with him, of him sharing his story about being a victim of sexual assault. We just wanted to make sure that um, he was going to be able to share it on his page um, because, again, he had overwhelming responses to him sharing last time. 
And so we want to make sure that people are able to continue to support him. This time, as he continues sharing his story. So, Cedric, we're going to continue. Um, last time, it got really emotional. And so I stopped the interview because I wanted to give you a chance to pull yourself together and for you to gather your thoughts and kind of um, have some clarity and time for you to actually understand the impact of you sharing your story with other people. So can you just tell us what happened pretty much immediately after your interview last time? What are some things that have taken place since then? Uh, well, towards the end of the interview, um, it was like you said, it was very emotional for me. Uh, kind of broke down in tears. Um, it took me a little while to kind of pull myself together. Um, again, that's this is very new for me, but it's also new for everybody else because nobody really knew about any of this. So, um, of course, since then, you know, we've got several viewers that have watched. Um, I've had quite a few inboxes um, of people, um, you know, most of my friends, but again, none of my friends knew about this. So a lot of people just really cheering me on, um, letting me know that it takes a lot of courage to speak up and tell my story. And that to continue because it definitely is inspiring people. I've had at least three inboxes where people were actually inspired by my story. Um, and most of it was it inspired them to go to therapy. But at least they're able to talk about what's going on with them and not keeping it in. And that means a lot to me. If I can inspire at least one person that means I did what I was supposed to do. And so um, that, that speaks volumes for me. Um, I know if my mom is watching, she watched the interview after. So she watched the watch party after the interview took place. And a lot of it was news to her. Um, I mean, she kind of knew, but she didn't know all of the details of what really happened. So. Um, you got to put yourself in her shoes as my mom, as my parent. Um, just hearing about all this um, definitely put her in emotional state, put her in shock. And so she definitely, I had a nice little long conversation with her about, you know, what happened. And, you know, of course, there's the who, what, when, where, why's and all that. And, and I had to kind of ensure my mom that at that time, who I was at that time as a teenager, as a young man, I honestly, I, you know, I didn't feel like I could tell her what was going on. And it's not that, you know, I felt like she was going to judge me or anything like that because me and my mom have a great relationship. You know, I've always been able to come to her about anything. I just did not feel like I could come to her about that. I mean, I didn't feel like I could come to anybody about that because, like I said, no, nobody really knew. So um, that was a emotional conversation with my mom, of course. Um, and again, like I said, a few people reached out, um, just kind of like a pat on the back, like, I know I appreciate you. Um, but here recently, um, of course, as you were with me, we went to dinner uh, a few days ago. I saw a guy um, at the restaurant who was at the waiting area, because um, I think it was like maybe a 30 to 45 minute wait to be seated. You know, we had already got seated. Our party was less. But I um, walked my daughter to the bathroom, and as I'm waiting, and I look down, and there's this guy sitting on the couch. And when I tell you he resembled this guy, my um, user, I guess, um, looked just like him. The facial hair, the haircut, the 
eyes, nose, like you even had the same glasses. And for a split second, like I just froze. And uh, of course, nobody really kind of knew what was going on because I literally, you know, I just walked my daughter to the bathroom. So I was really just kind of waiting on her to come out, but when I seen that and I froze. And it was like I was in shock. And I'm just looking like, I know this is not him literally sitting right near me. And um, honestly, I didn't, I didn't know what to do. You know, it just kind of took me back. Um, almost took me back to the mindset that I was when it happened. Um, and that's been so many years ago. So um, and if you watched the previous interview, I had said that my abuser had got out of prison maybe like a couple years ago and um, tried to find me on Facebook. So I know that he knows who I am. I know that he remembers me. Um, and like I said, I was just, I was stuck. I was in shock. Um, and it wasn't until the guy stood up and looked at me that I realized that it wasn't him. Because if he knew who I was, he probably would have spoke. Uh, but this guy just happened to be, you know, a couple feet taller. <laughs> and uh, and it definitely wasn't him on it. But like I said, there was a striking resemblance. And I just, I didn't know what to do. I was just stuck. So um, that was kind of hard. Um, that was kind of hard to deal with uh, just at that moment. Um, and even, you know, eating dinner with my family, uh, with my wife here. Um, and I didn't tell my wife you know, right away what happened. I didn't even tell her until it was like a day later when we got home um, about what happened at the restaurant. And so, I mean, I just... So many thoughts went through my mind. You know, it's not like I'm sitting here every day thinking about what I would do if I seen this guy again. You know, my mom, she definitely told me that if she saw this guy again, that he was going to hurt. And, you know, and I understand that, you know, because I definitely, I feel the same way. But then it was just, it was a lot, it was just shocking to just look and see this guy. And for a second, I thought it was him. Um, so I still have certain, I don't know, time situations, uh, where it kind of gets to me a little bit, um, like a lot the, the first situation happened in a small space, in a, in a closet. So even now for me, when I'm in areas that are very similar to that, I'm very cautious. I'm very paranoid. I need to know if the door locked, if it's locked from the inside or the outside, which way the door turns, you know, and, and who's in there, you know, and, 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 and it's just, it's, it's a lot for me. So, um, and I think that's, that's one of the hardest things that I still, that I deal with now, uh, is, is that. So, that's a lot of, Um, so I want we want to go back to the actual situation for a moment because we really didn't get a chance to finish. Um, tell us from the point of you being contacted that there were other victims. Um, how did how did that take place, and then what was the result of the charges that were filed against him? So. Uh, when I was contacted, um, apparently one of the other employees got a lawyer. Um, and I, I mean, I, I didn't know really about any of this, you know, at first, but uh, the lawyer contacted me, said that uh, several of my coworkers um, were kind of involved in this lawsuit. And it was against the place that I worked. And so, you know, I was 
I mean, it kind of threw me because it didn't happen right away. Um, this happened like a couple years later. Um, so at this point, I am in college. I'm, you know, miles and miles away, you know, and at this point, I tried to really kind of put it behind me. So it was kind of like my heart stopped for a second. You know, it's just like, what is this about? You know, and when they mentioned the name of the place that I worked, it was just like, it was just like a bad movie, like something that was haunting me over and over again, something that I tried to throw away and forget. And so, you know, I heard the little out. They basically were, um, were talking about um, the manager that he, Obviously, you know, he was arrested, um, but they were building the case against the place of employment. Uh, and so what they, the information they gave me was that the employers, the management, the staff, that they were aware that this guy was a predator, that he had um, prior charges and warrants against him in a completely different state and the fact that they knew about it and they still hired this guy he still worked for them um so the case was against them um so there was about 12 of us total um all guys that were involved in this case and and they wouldn't give me but so much information to let me know that i wasn't the only one that was involved in the situation and that they needed my testimony uh, to complete the case. You know, at this point, they had already talked to about seven or eight of the guys because a lot of them were still local. I moved away, so you know, it was probably a little harder to catch up with. But because of my relationship with the manager, the fact that we were cool, the fact that we spent a lot of time together and a lot of people knew that, one of the other guys gave my name to the lawyer to speak to me. So um, this was around the time where I had to give my mom a little more information about what happened. So at the end, I didn't really tell her all the intricate details, but I had to tell her something because at the time I wasn't driving while I was in, while I was out here at college in Charlotte. Um, so I literally had to take the train back home to Raleigh and my mom had to pick me up and my mom had to take me to this lawyer's office. I hadn't really been in any legal issues, any legal situations before. And so my mom was, was my number one fan. She's the number one person that I trust when it comes out and stuff like that. So, you know, I just, I gave her enough you know, so she would have my back. So we get there and it's like, it's like a panel almost. So the the lawyer that spoke to me on the phone is there, but then there was probably a handful of other people there. I don't know if they were also lawyers. Um, I'm not sure, but it was one of those long conference tables, but then it's like only five of them, and then there's one of me, and I had to sit in a specific area, and then they even um, had the recorder, you know, like you see on the TV shows that they put down, and they're like, you know, let you know that we're recording this, blah, 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 blah. So my mom couldn't be in the room uh, for me to uh, record my testimony. So, of course, this is... It, it, putting me back in shock, back in the situation. Like I said, a couple of years had already passed. You know, I was in college, I had moved on. So um, it was just a lot, you know, it was, as I sat at the table, reliving this story, telling this story again. And this was my first time telling the story again, but uh, since it happened um, and I was shaking. I was shaking and it took me a while to even get my story out. But um, I finished letting them know what happened. Um, they let me know that they had a couple more people to talk to, a couple more testimonies. 
once they got everything together, um, they will contact me and let me know what happens with the case and all of that. Um, and so uh, I can't think of how much time went by. It was probably um, some months, but um, the, said everything finished with the case. Um, and then they had a, I don't even think it was a lawyer. It was a representative um, because at that point I came back to Charlotte. And like I said, I was in college. So there was a representative that had an office here so that I didn't have to go back to Raleigh to finish signing any paperwork. Um, and they basically just let me know um, that the abuser, that he was in jail. Um, they couldn't tell me how long he was in there for. Um, and they let me know that um, as far as a place of employment, that all management staff that was involved, that had any knowledge, were terminated. Um, they didn't let me know about anything else that happened as far as for them, as far as consequences. Um, and then basically they let me know that as, as far as the case is concerned, that I was allotted a certain amount of money based off of my testimony and I had to sign for it. And in signing for it, in taking the money, um, it was basically also letting me know like that I can no longer work for that company um, anymore. And so, I mean, of course, I didn't have no problem with it. I hadn't worked there in several years. You know, I'd already moved on. I'd already went to college. I'm already in another city. So, um, you know, I signed everything and, and, and moved forward. Um, I didn't mind the fact that I didn't know all the information about what was going on because I had no intentions of talking to nobody else about it or even bringing it back up again. So um, I took my money and I went about my business. I didn't care about who got what. I didn't care about the other guys and how much they got. I just went about my business. I just wanted to move on with my life. So. So you later did find out kind of how long he served. How much how much time did he serve based I, on the information that you know about? Um I don't know. It's, it's several years I'm assuming because when he contacted me via Facebook a couple of years ago, I don't know if he got out before that and then he just got on Facebook and found me because keep in mind that at 16, 17 years old I didn't have Facebook. Mm -hmm. I don't even know if Facebook was around. You know, so So yeah. how long ago was that that he contacted you? Um, this was like, like two years ago. Okay, and so that that's that's quite a few years. Yeah, yeah so, but we're not sure or you're not sure if, that's, if he started no, off I, that time. I, I didn't even try to look up. I didn't even try to. I didn't want any information. I didn't even talk to the guys that were involved in the case. I didn't. I didn't even want to know. So after you signed the papers, you you basically just went on without your life. I cut ties with the whole thing because I didn't even want. Like I knew that it was necessary for me to do that because lawyers reached out to me. They needed my testimony. I want. I felt like that was the right thing to do. However, I, I, I didn't, like I said, I didn't talk about it anymore. So, you know, I knew that was the right thing to do. So I knew I had to then, but if I didn't have to, I wasn't planning on telling nobody. You know, that was just a part of my life that I shut away in the box. I, didn't, I wasn't planning on even talking about it. So how, you're talking about it now, um, from that point of signing the papers and trying to move on with your life till a couple of weeks ago when you shared your story with us live. Um, what are some things that have happened between them that have either reminded you of it or what, what have been some triggers for you since then? Or have there been any triggers? Has anything happened that has made you think about it or did you really put it in a box and it just opened up within the last couple of years? Um. Well, like I said before, the 
eating the the framework was memo on Facebook. Um, that definitely was was huge because I mean, popped up with his picture, and I don't know if he just looked the same or if it was an old picture, but it literally looked just like him from back then when it happened. Um, so, and of course, like I said, with that being several years ago, I'm 34 years old now. That we're talking about 16, 17 years old is a long time. So that just, that was a lot. Um, so it kind of made me a little paranoid. So seeing the guy in the restaurant a couple of days ago, it kind of resembled him. And it's just like, now I'm, I'm thinking to myself, like, God, am I going to just like start seeing people that look like him now? What if he like is around? What if, you know what I mean? Like, um, so that, you know, between that and again, like I mentioned earlier, I can't be in small places like closets because of what happened. Super, super paranoid. And then even down to the last incident that happened in the car, when I have a passenger, and I'm, you know, I'm real like, I need to kind of know what you're doing. You know, don't. Um, like you touching all on the radio and stuff, or whatever. It's just, it's just like a, I don't, know, I don't know if it's paranoia, I don't know what you call it, but it's, it's I don't know, it's, it's, it, it kind of brings it back a little bit. Um, so, uh, I mean, you know, that's, that's kind of it. I mean, I haven't really had any other triggers. Um, So, why now? Why are you ready to share your story now? What's making you share your story now? Well, following the Speak Up and Inspire series, um, and just kind of knowing what you're doing with this podcast, um, it kind of inspired me. You know, just knowing your story and what you've done and and for the last year, just watching all of the episodes, watching all of the super inspirational people um, every week, uh, going to some of these events and hearing these people speak, um, some of their stories are just mind blowing. And it's just like, there, there's a range. There's some of their stories where it's, huge what happened to him was very very severe and then you know where you know this person maybe it wasn't as severe and when it started kind of coming back to me you know and, and started really kind of thinking about what happened to me i'm like well i don't feel like mine was as bad as this person over here or this person over here but in seeing all of that and, and like i said listening in to the podcast every week um, it kind of let me know that no story is too small, too big. Everybody's story is not the same, but it doesn't mean that you're not a victim or a survivor um, and that your your story and your voice can still be heard. You know? So, um, like I said, that, that just, that really pushed me and inspired me. And um, it really was Like I said, in the last year and a half, two years, you know, fighting with my depression and my mental health, you know, and, and trying to figure out my self love, everything just kind of came out, you know, especially when I started seeing my therapist. So it's just like, this is something that's holding me back. This is something that's heavy on my heart, and I need to do something about it so that I can grow, so that I can be the best version of myself, which is my ultimate goal when, I, you know, when talking to my therapist about uh, healing for myself, uh, for working on myself, is to be the best version of myself. And so he told me you know, something very, very important. He said, in order to do that, you have to lay out everything that you've dealt with, that been through and you have to face it 
And I looked at him like, I mean, like, I'm, I've been through this stuff before. I faced this stuff. And he's like, no. He was like, you have to face it. Everything that you've done, everything you've been through, you have to face it. And then you'll grow from that. And then you will start becoming the best version of yourself. And so this is something I've been holding on to by myself for the longest time. And so I, just, I have to get it out. And I ain't gonna lie, I was scared. I'm still a little scared, a little nervous, but it felt good a couple of weeks ago to get that out. You know, after I got through all the emotions and everything, it really felt good. But what really made me feel good was the response. The people, the inboxes, the people telling me they were proud of me, the, the about the courage. I, I didn't really know what to expect. And that meant the world to me. That made me feel important. That made me feel inspirational. And I, I love that feeling, you know, and that you know, I wanna keep that feeling. So I did have some people that didn't respond the way that I thought they would. And so, you know, they kind of came at me like, why are you coming out with this now? Oh, you just looking for attention. Oh, you know, you putting all your business out there. You know, you know we know you. Um, and I was kind of bothered by that. And you should be. No one should judge you for sharing your story. That's very immature of somebody to to come at you like that in a negative way for sharing your story. Yeah, it's um, your story to share. I was very very bothered by that. So a lot of the the people that had inboxed me that reached out to me um, in a positive way, you know, I I kind of reached back to them and I was like, hey, you know, this kind of happened. I got some negative feedback from this. You know. And I feel some type of way, you know, and like, is it okay for me to feel like this? Um, and everybody was like, you know, like, everybody's not going to you know, be supportive, but can't nobody tell you about you, you know? And it's, and it's, and it's like you said, it's, it's my story. It's my story to tell. I can tell you right now, everybody that knows me, that knows of me, they know I could care less about the likes about the comments, about any of that. I'll put whatever I want to put out there in the world, out there on Facebook, Instagram, whatever. You go look at my page right now and you look at some stuff and be like, oh my God. I take my aunt, she unfollows me like every other week. <laughs> you know, family members be like, oh, I can't believe he put that on. I don't, because I, that's, that, that's not, I'm going to say what I want to say. You know, and, and if you love me, you rock with me, then you appreciate, you know me, you know me for that. So I'm not doing any of this for attention. I can care less about the attention. My goal, when I gave my story a couple weeks ago, has already been met. Has already been met. I inspired somebody, whether it was one, whether it was a hundred. I inspired somebody you know and that that's that's all it takes you know it's a lot of people out here that are going through stuff um i've reached out several times you know i've probably been dealing with depression for a long time honestly um it's just i didn't really say nothing about it until here recently in the last couple of years and it's like if i make a post and say i'm depressed or, you know, just I'm not mentally stable. I'm going through it right now. And it's it's so odd that I would get so little response to that. But then if I say that I broke my arm, I broke my leg, everybody's calling, everybody's inboxing, everybody's worried. You know, there's been a couple times where I cut my phone off or just, you know what? not dealing with the phone today. I need that break, that mental break. And uh, this was, as a matter of fact, this was around Christmas, Christmas Eve. Um, spending it with my lovely wife. 
you know, my family, and didn't answer the phone for like it might have been like twenty four hours, something like that, you know. And I had people, you know, like my family, even some of my friends that were like blowing me up, like ready to call the cops to find me, like I don't know what's going on with him. And before that, I had reached out and said, I'm depressed. I don't like the way I'm feeling right now. I'm not happy with my life right now. And and, and, and nobody said anything. Nobody said anything. And then the, the people that did, it was like, oh, just take a drink, you'll be all right. Oh, just go to sleep, you'll be all right. Oh man, that's, you'll be okay. You just tired or something like that. It's like, oh, we just gonna play it off. Like, it's not a big deal. And so to the people that have reached out to me, they let me know, like, it is a big deal. And it means a lot when somebody just reaches out just to say, hey, you doing all right? Everything cool? You good? Like, when I get those inboxes, when I get those phone calls, they come right on time. You know, it come right on time. So, um, you know, when the people come at me with the negative stuff, it's just like, you know, I'm petty. So my petty power is going to activate and I'm, I'm, I'm ready to snap back. But then it's not worth it. It's not. It's not. And um, I, I get that, that question often, too, when I'm deciding to or people see a flyer with me on it speaking or sharing my story or on the on the podcast I share my story almost every single podcast I share a piece of me um and I've gotten the same thing I know um Katrina has expressed to me that she's gotten it from from people um Gina said the same thing there's been so many advocates and so many survivors who are sharing their story that have had to deal with people like One, maybe accusing them of not telling the truth, looking for attention. Um, Why are you putting your business out there? You know, I didn't know this about you. Why are you doing this? And it's because people don't understand. If you've never been a victim or if you've never been a survivor of sexual assault or domestic violence, gun violence, any kind of violence against you or your family, you don't understand how powerful it is to finally open up and speak and share your story. A lot of people don't understand that. But then there's other people who do understand, but yet you're speaking up puts fear in their hearts because they have not spoken up yet. And I've learned that as well. I've learned that sometimes people react negatively because they have something inside that they haven't opened up about and they're more angry at themselves or they're more ashamed of themselves or they're feeling something in themselves because they haven't let it out, but they've been hiding and holding it in for so long. And now you've done it. And it's like, well, why are you doing that? When it's really them saying that to themselves. So, you know, I don't ever want you to, um, if someone says anything negative negative to you about you sharing your story, then you just simply reply without the clap back, without the pettiness, this is my story. You know, this is my story. I have the right to share my story. And if you don't support me sharing my story, then, you know, we all have a choice. We we don't have to listen to it, you know, Um, because you have a story to tell. And you being a man sharing your story is even more powerful, even more um, needed. And that's what I want to touch on this. Not saying that there's not any men that are just up out there, but you don't hear about it as much. And we have a strong voice. Mm-hmm. You know, whether it's we went through it or whether we are like myself, you know, being married to you and supporting you because you've been through it. I've, I've met several husbands and boyfriends that, you know, have to figure out how to be there for their significant other because they went through something so serious and traumatic. And it's like, it's, it's it's a learning process for us. I mean, even when you started speaking up and doing engagements and events, a lot of the information was new to me. So I'm like, you know, and then people are looking at me like, well, how do you deal with that? Well, I don't know, because I just found out. But, you know, I'm, I, I got her back, you know what I mean? A hundred grand, I'm, I'm right here supporting, but, 
it, it means a lot when the person that you love the most is holding you down, you know? So it's like for me to come out and talk about my story and you're my number one fan. You you are supporting me and, you know, you let me know like how to kind of go about it and to stay positive and that's been a huge help to me and I just feel like the voice of men, whether you know it's just in a support way or you know if they got stories, whatever, that that's something that definitely needs to be heard. We need more of it. Honestly, you know, now people are coming to me about speaking engagements, mm-hmm. and that's it's the wave kind of came fast, but I'm I'm ready, you know, and and that that means a lot. You know, even the um, the women at Safe Alliance, you know, the fact that they are ready for an all man panel, you know, to, to hear let me hear this from a man's point of view, you know, that's huge. It is huge. And um I think that you introducing that, um, an all male panel talking about being a survivor or being a victim, I think that is such a powerful movement that you are starting. Um, I have seen other panels of men who are advocates, but not a whole panel of men who are victims or survivors. Um, I haven't seen that um, myself personally. I'm sure that it has happened, but you saying, you know what, I'm gonna put this together. This is something that I need to do and this is something that I want to do. And then you went out and found survivors who are willing to share their their story um, is a powerful thing. And I'm so proud of you and I'm really looking forward to what this year is going to bring for you. And just like you have been my number one cheerleader, I'm going to be there supporting you every single step of the way. Um, Because I think it's important. I think it's important for you to share your story. And whoever's watching, this is probably going to come out wrong, but the heck with anybody who says anything negative to you about you sharing your story. It is your story. They have no right to say anything negative to you because one thing about sharing your story, and I know this myself, I know this about other survivors, I know this about other speakers who share their story, it takes a lot of courage and it takes a lot of heart. It takes a lot of yourself to share your story and to be transparent, to be open and honest about something that was painful to you in your life. And no one has the right to question that. No one. So um, I'm really, really proud of you for making this your year of breaking your silence, of talking about what happened to you, um, sharing it, you know, talking to your mom about it, um, talking to us about it, talking to me about it. Um, and I wanted you to share without saying names you received a message from a mother. Um, and I want you to share that. What how, what impact, it was feedback from a mother to you after listening to your the first part one about you sharing your story. A mother approached you about her son. And I just want you to share that very briefly without saying any names um, and how that made you feel. Because I think that was one of the key responses one of the one of i'm sure there's several but one of the most important responses to you um and so i want you to share that what was that response to you um that was that was the first response um and it was kind of before a couple weeks ago when i told my story it probably was maybe like a month or two before that that I just made this random post about working on myself and about, hey, my name is Cedric and I am a survivor of sexual assault, period. I left it at that. And I'm pretty sure that when people were scrolling and they read it, it was just like, you know, your eyes got big. Um, but this person in particular, um, I do a lot of networking with uh, she's a great friend of mine. Um, we do a lot in the community get together. And 
you know, she sent me a message and she just said that not only that she was proud of me uh, for speaking my truth and speaking out, but she said that my story that her son watched, uh, he watched my story and that he had a lot going on, a lot that he was holding on to and that it inspired him to speak up and inspired him to seek help and inspired them to see a therapist to talk about what was going on with him. And that, when I tell you that, that feeling that meant the world to me, that was the one response that I needed to let me know what I was doing was right. You know, at the same sense of when people reached out to me about seeking a therapist uh, to seek help about what's going on, about writing down my problems, my feelings, and, and being able to talk to somebody about it that can help me with it. And i am be honest, when I started seeing my therapist, it was the scariest yet the best thing that I could have done uh, because it has helped me on so many levels um, becoming a whole man. And what was that? What was that a practice again that he what, that you did? What? You said well, you did something that was what you needed. What was that? I didn't hear all of it. No, no, I'm, I'm saying that him, you know, that the fact that I inspired okay. her son okay. to seek help to speak out, to go see a therapist, to talk about what was going on with him, you know, that was huge. Okay. And I'm I'm pretty sure that maybe she might have been struggling with him. She might have had some issues with him. She might have been trying her best as a mother to figure out what's going on with her son. And so seeing that was what he needed and what she needed. And so, like I said, that, that was the one inbox the one response that I needed to let me know that I did the right thing that I inspired somebody that somebody took my story and it helped them with their story um, if they have a story but um, a lot of this kind of goes to the main point a lot of men are afraid to to see therapy um, it's like you know, trying to force them to go see therapy or whatever is the worst thing ever. Like, they don't want to go. They don't want to talk about their problems. They don't want to face their problems. And honestly, like I said, it's, it's been one of the best things that I've done. It's scary. Um, each session that I have is very intense because of the things that I have to talk about because I have to be so true to myself and I have to talk about things that I probably didn't want to talk about, or haven't tried to talk about, or tried to put away, or not really face the truth. And after these sessions, I'm left so raw. That's, that's probably the best word or term I can use, is I'm left so raw. It's like when you get out of the shower and your pores are all opened up and, and you're just breathing it all in. And it's like, but I have to return back to the real world after my sessions. And so getting a uh, support system, you know, solid people that I can vent to or talk to, people that don't judge me, people that can be a listening ear, people that can support me, that can push me to be positive, that can inspire me, you know, building that, which is what I'm currently doing now, so that after these intense sessions, and when I have to go back to the real world, that I don't fall apart, that I don't fall deeper into depression. And so, like I said, this has been a great move for me. I feel like I'm um, a much better person than I was last year or the year before that. Um, and now that I'm 
fixing some of these holes in myself so that I can be a complete man, so that I can be the best version of Sid that I want to be, that I want everybody else to see. So um, that, like I said, that one response was everything. After that, it was followed by several responses of just, you know, I'm proud of you, you know, keep speaking the truth and stuff like that, whatever. But that one, that that particular one was the one. Yeah. Um, and I'm hoping, I hope that she's listening or that she will listen um, as we share part two of you um, breaking your silence so that she knows how important that was to you. I'm sure that you already told her, but just so she knows how and how powerful and impactful that was um, for you. So we already have two things in the works for you to share your story publicly. You're already publicly talking on our podcast um, that is gonna reach our followers, which our followers has become pretty, pretty big. But this is a podcast, we're looking at a, a screen. You're gonna be doing two public events pretty soon. So tell us about those events and tell people, you know, about them and, you know, invite people out because I think it's important that you have support when you go out and share your story, just like I need support when I go out and share my story, you go with me and I invite my friends and family. It's important for you to have your support system as well. So we have an event. The first event is coming up on April um, 18th. So tell us a little bit about that. And, you know, like, what are you thinking about? What do you think that is going to be your starting point? Because that's going to be your first actual public event where you're going to be sharing your story. Um, so the event is Saturday, April 18th. Um, this is going to be in Concord, North Carolina. Um, uh, Queen City Extreme. That's a 8230 popular tent, pop, well, popular tent, sorry, popular tent uh, road. Um, and it'll be from five to nine, I believe. Uh, we'll have swag bags, uh, vendors, uh, workshops, and there'll be a phenomenal you know, guest list of, of speakers amongst myself. Um, again, you know, I'm, I'm Scared and excited, you know, to to really be out there as a speaker. Um, and then even with with this guest list, I'm the only male speaker. So um, I feel like that Tiffany has provided me with a channel where I can push to become better, but that I'm providing this outlet for other men to do what I'm doing. And um, I, I couldn't be you know, more proud to be able to do that. Um, the, this event is called Speak Up, Your Voice is Power. Uh, the flyer will be dropping tonight. Um, the tickets are, how much? Uh, the tickets are twenty dollars. Um, there will be a link uh, when I drop the flyer for you to purchase tickets. Um, my friends, my family, uh, the people that really support me, I would appreciate it greatly if y'all could uh, get a ticket just to come out, show a brother some love, just to be there for me. Like I said, this is gonna be my first time, you know, speaking at an event, you know, really uh, giving this thing a, a try. So. Uh, like I said, it's April 18th uh, in Concord. So make sure you come out. Like I said, I'll drop the flyer and I uh, want you guys to support. Um, also, and this is one that I'm very, very excited for as well, is April 28th. Save the date, mark your calendars. April 28th is the all male panel I'm taking the guys with me to Safe Alliance. Um, if you guys have, well, didn't really do video or anything like that, but at Safe Alliance, uh, at the homeless women and children that are there, 
Um, a lot of them are, are still kind of going through their situations. And like I mentioned before, they want a man's perspective on what's going on. They probably don't know any male survivors, any male victims, any, any men, period, that might have went through something that they also went through. So got a couple guys that are going to come with me to take a tag along. They also have stories as well. And um, I'm just I'm looking forward to that to be able to to set that up because I honestly I haven't seen that yet. And I feel like there's a lot of people that haven't seen that yet, but they need to see it. It definitely needs to happen. And if I can make it happen, I'm with it. I'm gonna make it happen. So April is a big month. April is also the month for uh sexual was it sexual assault awareness uh so the the teal ribbon that's you know you see that it's going to be on the flyer so um that's the you know that's the so that's why april is so big it's so important to us as men so men i appreciate your support i need your support women i appreciate you guys pushing the men to do what they do to use their voice to speak up Um, any men out there, if you have a story, um, if you know somebody that has a story, if you're a friend of the person that has a story, um, don't feel, I mean, feel free to, uh, message me, hit me up. If you need to talk about it, if you need to vent a little bit, um, I can definitely tell you, you know, my two cents, or I can just be a listening ear. Um, so if you're out there, hit me up. Women, if you know men that have a story, you know, encourage them to speak up or you can slide to my information and tell them to hit me up. OK, it, we have to work together here. To speak up to get our voices out. Tedrick, I. Um, I am truly proud of you um and not just because you're my husband not because i know you but because i know that this was really really hard for you to share um and i know that it's really hard for men to share their stories i know that a lot of times men don't share their stories because they think they're going to be called weak that people are going to see them as less of a man that people are going to chastise them or be negative like you had to deal with yourself um, that some people might look at you and, and question your sexuality and so many other things. But there are also people out there who are applauding you, who are supporting you, who um, have been inspired by you, who have been empowered by you, who um, are there to, to, uh, to let you vent, to let you cry if you need to, to let you laugh, to let you scream, um, who are truly in your corner, who truly care about you and truly love you, and who are truly lining up behind you to support you. Um, so I'm just, I just wanna say that I'm very proud of you in so many ways for what you're doing. I think this year is gonna be a year of healing for you and really finding yourself. Because one thing I can say as a survivor is that until you are able to speak your truth and live your truth, then you really can't be your truth. Um, and that means talking about being a victim of anything traumatic. It doesn't have to be sexual assault. It doesn't have to be domestic violence. Anything traumatic in your life that you don't face it's still there and it's still hurtful and it's still painful. And until you get it out, whether you share it with an audience or you share it on a panel or you just share it with your wife or you just share it with your counselor, getting it out is so important. And that's one of the reasons why I started the Speak Up and Inspire Series podcast for people to get their stories out. So I'm really, really proud of you for getting your story out because you have been an inspiration to a lot of people already and you are just beginning. So everybody, I hope that you will. Oh, I don't think so. 
um, you're getting a lot of praise, but not, not, not too many questions. So we're gonna go ahead and open up for any questions. If there's anybody who has any questions for Cedric, we're gonna take a few minutes to answer those questions. Um, I know that Tina in Columbia, South Carolina, said that she would like for you to bring your all men panel to uh, Columbia. Um, so she asked us about April 25th, but April 25th is the mm -hmm. stop in um, Maryland. So we're gonna be there. So she said she's gonna look at some dates and get back to us about that. She would love for you to bring your panel to, um, to Columbia. And so that's the only questions that we've had so far, but we're gonna go ahead and just give you a moment that if you have any questions for Cedric, whether it's about his story, whether it's about what he's doing, whether it's about you wanting him to come and share at your event, um, please go ahead and do that now on the thread so we can go ahead and address those questions. Um, I also wanna put out there the April 18th event. It is going to be um, Butterfly Visions Project and Family, which is his organization's first sexual assault awareness event. Um, he is the only male speaker, so he needs your support. April 18th, if you're not doing anything, it's from five to nine in the evening. The tickets are only $20. Those tickets go back to the community to help our mission, to help victims of sexual assault and um, domestic violence. Um, but this is his first public event. So if you're not doing anything or you are doing something early in the day, please make time to come. The tickets are only $20. You spend $20 just going to McDonald's and feet and getting uh, two Happy Meals and upsize them and all that kind of stuff, <laughs> if that's what they call, or going out and buying two packs of cigarettes or going out and buying a CD of Drake or Chris Brown or whatever, $20, that's not a lot of money. I promise you it'll be well spent. There's gonna be vendors there. There's gonna be um, demonstrations, uh, dark lines, Dark Lion Self-Defense is going to be there. Um, he's one of our sponsors. He's gonna be doing self-defense demonstrations. We have um, speakers. We have Katrina Thomas of Loving Yourself, No More Abuse. We have Dee Hardrich of Minute Moment Project. We have Miss Lisa Holman. Holman? Hollis. 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 Lisa. Lisa. Ooh, Hollis. I don't think it's Hollis. Lisa, I don't wanna say your name wrong. I'm looking. Um, Lisa, Lisa Holmes, um, she is a new speaker. She's a new um, young lady who is sharing her story just like um, Cedric. I do believe this is gonna be her first time speaking to and sharing her story as well. Um, we're also going to have the beautiful Miss Nicole Williams. She is going to be doing a um, performance for us, sharing some of her work that is um, based off of her being a survivor, and I'm definitely looking forward to that. Um, she is part of the Queen City Dolls, so she will be there as well. We have a beautiful panel and an inspirational and very powerful panel of speakers that are gonna be there on April 18th from 5 to 9 p.m. in the Concord area. So Cedric will go ahead and post it on his page, how you can get tickets. Um, if you're not able to make it, we are donating tickets to some of the victims or residents at the Safe Alliance Domestic Violence um, Shelter. So if you're not able to make it, you can buy a ticket and then message me or message us at Butterfly Business Project and say, hey, I just bought a ticket, but I can't make it. And I will reach out to some of the victims that are in Safe Alliance Shelter that I have um, connections with first. I will reach out to them first. And then I will also let the staff know there that we have tickets to our April 18th Speak Up Your Voices Power event. Um, I wanna go ahead and say thank you to Ms. Grace McLean. She um, donated a ticket and I already have a survivor who is no longer at Safe Alliance. She is now um, on her journey to healing. She is a survivor. She wrote a poem about being a victim. And so she is our first um, survivor from Safe Alliance who um, is getting a free ticket that's been donated. So thank you, Ms. Grace McLean, for giving us our first donated ticket. Um, so please, if you are available April 18th, please come out, come to support Cedric, come support myself, come support all of the other powerful speakers that are gonna be coming out on April 18th, sharing their stories of being survivors of sexual assault. 
um, come out, see the demonstrations. Uh, there's going to be vendors there as well. It's going to be an amazing, amazing night. Get dressed up, come looking beautiful and handsome, and come have a good night with us. It's from 5 to 9, April 18th at Queen City Extreme in Concord, North Carolina. I am looking at the thread. Um, you're getting a lot of praises, a lot of you go boy, a lot of thank you for sharing your story. A lot of your voice is powerful. We don't have any questions. So we're going to go ahead and close out right now. But if at a later date, even if it's later on today, if you just want to have our private conversations, please reach out to Cedric um, or myself. Um, and we would definitely answer your questions or provide any resources or feedback to you that we can. Would you like to say anything to close out? <laughs> okay. <laughs> April 18th, come out and support Cedric at his first public event sharing his story. Everyone, have a great night. And thank you for listening <laughs> and sitting in and supporting Cedric on part two, Breaking His Silence. Have a good night, everybody. <laughs> Is it still going? <laughs> Want us to keep going. <laughs> we are trying to <laughs> doing this. <laughs> well, so we are celebrating our anniversary this weekend. Uh our three year anniversary. Do that at the time. We really do need to do it. We but do that this weekend. It, it looks like it wants us to do something because it's not letting us. You know what? I'm just gonna just let it finish on its own and kind of walk away. Got that? I'm just gonna slide out the video. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I, I, it, 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 Is it working though? It's working. It's, it's, it's still, still going. I just went here just talking because for some reason the recording doesn't want to stop. You know what? I think I need a new laptop. Pretty nice. <laughs> it's still going. Let's see. I, I, I'm kind of scared to refresh. Try to refresh. Okay. I'm scared. Mm. I'm scared to refresh. Okay, something's going on. People will not send it. Uh, it's, 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 it's working. Yeah, it's working. <laughs> on the next episode of the <laughs> <laughs> So, um, yeah, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to hide that.